Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be here at Broadway Baptist Church. <laughs> Can't find a better place to be, I promise. We're going to have a wonderful time of worship this morning. If you are visiting with us, we're delighted that you're here. Please fill out the card of the, of the uh, bulletin thing, put it in the offering plate, or put it at the back, one of the little black boxes we now have around the building. And we're glad that you're here today. Well, we're here for one reason. This first hymn sort of says why we're here. It says, I will sing of my Redeemer. So let's stand and sing, would you please? sing a selection this morning it's a, a rather profound statement it just simply says holy God talks about our God
why do I sing about Jesus? Let's sing that hymn together. I know you'll like this one. Deep in my heart there's a gladness. Jesus has saved me from sin. Praise you. You may want to look that up. It's kind of not real familiar to us. It's called Speak, O Lord. The Word of God is living and active. That's what it says, Hebrews 4.12. Speak, O Lord. Let's sing it together.
He is not the deacon of the week, but he's the guy I see can come and pray. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come and we can worship in your house. We can hear your message. And we can speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray as we give our offerings, Lord, that you would just multiply them. Pray that they would reach people for Christ. Pray, Lord, that you be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross for the dearest and best, for the world of lost sinners was slain.
sacred cross I will ever be true in shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me one day to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a So much Vivian for that that is one of the great hymns of our faith the old rugged cross what a blessing how encouraging that is called that is a group that's come together called forgiven so they've been able to play with us and they're playing again for us at our second service with that well we have what we call parents children's church so miss Haley Lyons will you stand up if you are a child between, what do we say, second, third, fourth grade, we don't card little children. So you want to stand up at this time, little children, and you're going to follow Miss Haley downstairs for children's church. All the children are going to children's church. And then they will go from straight from children's church to Sunday school right after, right after that is over. So we want to open up our Bibles to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 19. This is a sermon series the second part of a three-week sermon series on the city of Sodom, one of the cities in the Old Testament that is spoken about all throughout our Bible, even including even the New Testament, and including Jesus spoke about Sodom. And we need to know today why Sodom is an important city for us to be aware of. If God included this in the Bible, and it's mentioned over and over and over again, there's a reason for that. And we're actually finally going to be revealed today the sin of Sodom. At this point, we do not know. All we know at this point, what we've been reading from last week, is that it is an evil city. It is a city that Lot moved near to begin with. Then he moved into the city. And then the Bible tells us he began serving as the gatekeeper or the greeter of the city. And some Bible commentators think he was even a magistrate meaning some type of judge for the city. So he shows up, and he starts judging the people of Sodom. And he came to that area because God had blessed him and his uncle Abraham so much that their uh, livestock did not have enough land there in Canaan. So Abraham gave them an option and says, well, you, you pick whatever land you want to live in. So he looked outside the promised land, into the southern area near the Dead Sea, 
near the cities of what the cities of the plain, what the Bible calls them, of what we call Sodom and Gomorrah, down, the, the, and down in that area. Now it's a desert area because of what God did. And then he moved all his livestock and his family down near, initially near Sodom, and then into Sodom. And then Abraham stayed in the promised land. God called Abraham to leave his land of Ur of the Chaldeans and to go settle into a new land called Canaan, which is the promised land. And he brought along his nephew. God didn't tell him to bring his nephew with him, but he brought along his nephew named Lot. And Lot finds himself in trouble. And one of the things we're going to see here in our Bibles is whenever you make one step outside of God's will, when you leave where you're supposed to be, you will find yourself... Um, uh, in a situation that Lot is going to find himself in. That you'll find yourself in a place that you shouldn't be, and you will start thinking and doing things that are immoral. And that's what we're about to see right here. So we're going to, tu- we're going to turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 19. In a little bit, I'm actually going to reference Romans chapter 1. This is a message here that is uh, one that... Um, needs to be spoken about because it's very applicable for today. Last June, I was in Paris, France, and we were on a tour, and we drove past the U.S. Embassy. I believe I've told this story before. We drove past the U.S. Embassy, and there, it was in the month of June, and there was the United States flag flying over the embassy. And then under that flag, there was a rainbow flag. And I looked around all the other embassies, and our embassy, the U.S. Embassy, it was the only embassy in Paris, France, that had a rainbow flag flying. Now, why would a rainbow flag be flying underneath the United States flag in Paris, France, last June? I think our answer is going to be revealed right here in Genesis chapter 19. So, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read these verses here. It says, the two angels, now, now remember, who are these angels? These angels showed up, came to Abraham. And there are actually three men. One was the Lord, and two of them, we learn, are angels. And they came to really announce to the Abraham, says, a year from now, you're going to have a baby. And Sarah laughed. She's 90 years old. It was a shocking, breaking news, and the Lord had to rebuke her for that. Then they looked over to their left, and they saw this area called the cities on the plain, and they were going to destroy it. Abraham, there is a negotiation period with the Lord, which is really odd in Scripture. It's the only place we see that. They they negotiated from the Lord from 50 righteous people down to 10. Abraham believed, he knew his nephew Lot lived in Sodom, and he thought, surely there are 10 righteous people. We're going to find out if we can find 10 righteous people in Sodom. The answer is actually there were four, and then one didn't make it very far. We'll find out next Sunday. The two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting at Sodom's gateway. So now he's, he's the greeter. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed with his face to the ground and said, My lords, turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet, and spend the night. Then you can get up early and get on your way. Now, this verse tells us Lot knew these men didn't belong in this city. Notice, he picks them up right away. He recognizes, okay, these are righteous people. I need to quickly greet them. We need to quickly hurry to my house. And notice, you're going to only sleep in my house. And notice, very early in the morning, before all the other people get up, we're going to help you on your way. There's an urgency with Lot. Why? Why does Lot recognize these men don't belong in this city. There's something going on in Sodom that we have not been told yet what it is. And Lot is very aware what it is going on. It's rampant, apparently, in this city. And he is going to quickly protect. He's not going to let them stay at the, at the Motel 6. Not going to let them uh, sleep out openly. We can't do that. You've got to quickly come to my house, and then the first thing in the morning, we're going to get you a big breakfast, and we're going to get you out of here. Y'all are just passing through. So the, this is what Lot's pitch is. Lot's going to totally take over these people. And he also probably knows, probably 
that they probably came also after speaking to Abraham because they came from that direction. Lot recognizes, hey, we just visited your uncle Abraham. We're just passing through. And these angels said, no, they said, we would rather spend the night in the square. Well, that would not be a good place for these two angels to spend the night at all. But look at this, verse 3. But he urged them so strongly that they followed him. The question goes, why would Lot, it doesn't just say he recommended, he urged them strongly, says, under no circumstance are you two men going to spend the night in the square. Like that of all things on earth, that will not happen here. Not on my watch. You're going to come to my house. You cannot spend the night in the square. That's a total no-no in this town. So Lot is very aware of what's going on. And it says, These angels followed him to his house. He prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread for them. And they ate. That is the first place in the Bible where we see the word unleavened bread used right there. Lot is the one who prepared it first. And he's prepared for these angels. Before they went to bed, now here's something that's about to happen. So it's getting nighttime. Before these angels go to bed, Lot's probably hoping and thinking, maybe no one saw these men come in. Maybe they just quickly came to my house, I met them at the front door, and we just quietly put maybe a pillow over their head, put some sheets over top of them, we just prayed to them quickly in my house. No one saw this. That's what he was hoping was going to happen. Here's some unleavened bread. He needs the Lord's blessing. He needs the Lord's protection. Because Lot is probably worried at this point. And his worries come true. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old. So these aren't just old men. These are the young men. This is what an immoral city looks like. Old men, young men, all the men. The whole population surrounded their house. All the men of this city came and found Lot's house. And it's being surrounded. They called out to Lot and said, where are the men who came to you tonight? These men of the city want to know where are these, these visitors? They're in our city. I believe probably the men of the city of Sodom Well, if you're going to come into Sodom and stay in our city, we can do whatever we want to you. You are free game. That's probably how they felt. It's very apparent they felt that way. Send them out. So now we're about to be revealed about why Sodom is such an immoral city. And they said, send them out so we can have sex with them. So now... You talk about the worst possible response by a man. Lot, could you imagine Lot actually saying, this response that Lot is about to give is unfathomable, what he's about to say. But this is what happens when you live in an immoral city. When you are in Sodom, Sodom can creep into your life. It can creep into your life. I mean, you think about this. this is, here we see the sin it's talking about here is homosexuality. And you, know, you think about how has homosexuality, how has the sin of homosexuality affected us today? And I'll tell you how it's, not, how it's affected us today. We aren't surprised anymore. You and I go somewhere, we see a gay man at the mall, we're not shocked. There's no surprise at all. I grew up in Alabama 25 years ago. If I went to the Gall- River Chase Gallery in Hoover, Alabama, If I saw a gay man at the mall, first of all, that would be shocking. That man would be stared at. People would be talking about beating him up. I mean, it would just have been unfathomable 25, 30 years ago to see a gay man in public doing this, just making himself very apparent. But now, this is how it's affected us. We are not surprised. No surprise. Many Christians have given in to this sin. No shock. Just, well, you know, times are changing. This is how things are today. It, you know, it used to not be this way, but now it's 2023. The world is changing. That's how it has affected us. The surprise of sin is no longer there. 
And my goodness, for some of you, maybe 50, 60 years ago, that would have been a revolt if that would have been made known in your community. There was someone like this. But here at Lot, he doesn't seem very surprised whatsoever. Folks, he knew this was coming. He knew this was going to happen. He brought these men into his home. And next thing you know, these two angels, they have been surrounded by the men of the city. And the men of the city are demanding sexual relations with these people, these two men. So Lot, look at this. Lot goes out to meet them. Now he's going to try his negotiation at the entrance. And he shut the door behind him. So he opens the door, shuts the door, says, guys, we need to have a chit-chat. Let's talk about this right now. Lot is fully aware that he's got all the men of the city. He's in a dilemma. And he says to these men, don't do this evil, my brother. So Lot knows it's evil. He knows this is wrong. He even calls the sin evil. Look, I've got two daughters who haven't been intimate with a man. I'll bring them out to you, and you can do whatever you want to them. What an awful father. Lot has become so depraved, he's saying, don't, don't do this evil thing. Look, I've got two daughters here, and they've never been intimate. Why don't you just take them? What an awful dad. But again, he... Lot probably knows these are angels, these are special men. He's morally depraved. He's been affected by the sin of Sodom. Now he's giving away his daughters. However, don't do anything to these men because they have come under the protection of my roof. So Lot is is trying to give away his other family members instead of these two angels. Terrible, terrible response by Lot. But notice he does call what the men are doing evil. He knows it's wrong. Look what the men of the city say. Get out of our way, they said, adding, this one came here as an alien, meaning Lot wasn't born in Sodom. He shows up as an outsider. He shows up as an alien, but he's acting as a judge. Don't miss that. Folks, that's what, you go and you find a homosexual today and you point out in the kindest way possible that homosexuality is wrong. It goes against God's plan. That's not how the Lord created us. And I'm going to show you that in Genesis chapter 1. He created us male and female for the purpose of repopulating and multiplying earth. Well, homosexuality goes against that. If you, in a kind way, Go and share that with someone. It is very likely that person is going to look at you and go, Daniel, how dare you judge me? You're, who, who gave you that authority to declare right and wrong? That is exactly what the men of Sodom said. They looked at Lot and said, how dare you call me a judge? Or how dare you judge us? Who made you a righteous man? You're in fact an alien. You're not even from the city. You came here and you stand at the gate and you greet and judge other people. They were mad at Lot because he called what they were doing evil. That is the problem right there. And they said, you can't judge me. Now, we'll do more harm to you than to them. So now they're threatening Lot. Lot's going to get beat up. They put pressure on Lot and came to break down the door. This is going downhill quickly. So the men of the city are going to bust inside of this house. The door's about to come down. Lot can't keep it shut anymore. So at this point, the angels realize we have a dilemma on our hand. The men of the city are busting the door down to have sex with angels. And they don't even realize they're angels. Do you see how morally depraved this situation is? Horrible situation. The whole town, and Lot is sitting there trying to hold the door shut, saying, here are my, here are my daughters, just take them. I mean, awful scenario here. And he goes on to say, now the angels at this point reached out, brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. So the angels have gotten involved. They've taken over. They struck the man who were at the entrance of the house, 
both young and old, with blindness, so that they were unable to find the entrance. You know, that is a perfect example of what people who, have, who are depraved sexually are. They're blind. They're spiritually blind. Part of getting saved is when the Lord opens up your eyes. And we have to remember, too, the Lord can save people from any sexual sin. No matter what they're struggling with, the Lord saves them. You come in repentance and in belief in Jesus Christ, the Lord can take a gay man and make him straight. The Lord can take a lesbian and set her desires for a man. The Lord has the power to do that. Why are, they, why are people confused? Because they're spiritually blind. In researching this week, you know, this should be frightening to us. I was looking, the generation behind me, I think it's called Generation Z. I think that's actually two generations behind me because we had Generation or the Millennial Generation and then Generation Z. Generation Z, now this is the TikTok generation. This is the folks at Lafayette High School right now. One out of four people in that generation, now this is not, not for just Lexington, this is for all the United States, claim to identify with the LGBTQ plus community. Now, that entails a whole, all sorts of stuff. But one out of four. Folks, that tells us this isn't going away. It's not going away at all. In fact, it's going to get more and more and more popular. And I want to tell you, too, soon you're not going to be able to hide on this issue. You're not going to be able to not state where you believe because they're going to, folks are going to want to know where do you fall on your beliefs on the LGBTQ plus community? Where do you believe? Are you part of the men of Sodom here? Or are you part of the righteousness of Abraham and what these angels came to do and what the Bible is very clear on? And there's not going to be a place to hide. Yesterday, we had an event up at our church, and I had the honor to speak at it. It's called the Right to Life. Uh, their annual meeting was here in our fellowship hall. It was a, a pro-choice, I'm sorry, it's not pro pro-life uh, event for, um, uh, for promoting life here in our community, in our state. And one of the guys who was there is not just Baptist. It was all sorts of different denominations, and uh, it was encouraging to see all the different ministers there, but... Uh, there was a Catholic priest who was there, and I had the opportunity to talk to him afterwards, and him and I were talking about this issue. And I went and uh, fact-checked this to make sure uh, before I shared it, it was true. He, he was talking about uh, this LGBT issue here in Lexington for the Roman Catholic Church. And he says it's a problem, because the way in the Roman Catholic Church work, you have a local priest who's over uh, just an individual church, like a pastor. But then above him, you have a bishop. And he says, what's going on here in our city, in the Roman Catholic community, is all the priests are on board with the scripture. But the bishop, the gentleman who's over all the churches, Roman Catholic churches here in this region, he is blessing gay marriage. And he is promoting this stuff. And it's creating a problem. So I went and researched this, and he's right. There was news articles about this a few years ago here in our community. I think I remember, some of you remember this. So you see, even for whatever denomination, it is going to have to be, whatever church, you are going to have to declare, here's what the Bible says. Here's what we believe on this issue. There's no place to hide on this anymore. So keep going here in your Bibles. It says here, these men have become blind. They're blind. And that is an example of what homosexuality does to folks. It's a spiritual blindness. Then the angel said to Lot, now this is somewhat sad. We're about to see about Lot's family. Because I believe this response is rampant for us today. It says, then the angel said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, daughters, anyone else in the city who belongs to you, get out of this place. Like, Lot, you need to hurry up, and it's time to find your family because we're going to get out of this city. It's turning dark. The men here in the city are all turn, are blind, but we need to go. And the reason why is because why these angels were initially sent from Abraham and the Lord, and they walked down that city, walked down the hill into this city, 
were finally revealed the angel's true purpose. It wasn't because they were just passing through. Their purpose is revealed here. It says, get out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people is so great before the Lord. There it is. Remember the reason why they came. The outcry had risen up to the Lord. So God sent the angels there to see, could it be true? Could the outcry that is so immense, that's reaching heaven, is it really this bad in Sodom? Could it be this bad in Sodom? And what's occurring here is the angels are realizing, yes, it is. It is that immoral of a city. The outcry is reaching the Lord. And so the, it's time for Lot and his family to leave the city. You know, many times in our lives, if we are surrounded by immorality, sometimes the best thing to do, or is a lot of times the best thing to do, is to leave that situation. It's just not for you. You don't need to be around these people. You don't need to be at this school. You don't need to be working with these folks. You don't need to be hearing this stuff over and over again. You don't need to be watching these type of TV shows. You don't need to be viewing those type of mute movies. It's moral trash. And the angels are saying, Lot, this is an immoral place. It's not for the people of God. So it's just time to get out of here. They're all blind. God's going to destroy this place. And it's not time for witnessing. You've already told them they're evil. They don't care. Let's leave. That's what the angels are trying to tell Lot. The outcry against the Lord is great. They've been sent to destroy it. And this is the last verse we're going to read. And I believe this is a key verse that teaches us how so many people respond today. If you go many times and you witness to a person who is involved in homosexuality and you witness to them and teach them the truth, the response you're about to see here is very common. You go and instruct people about God's judgment. The Bible teaches us when we die, we face the judgment of God. We give an account for our lives. So we want to make sure that the way we live our lives, that it honors the Lord. You want your family, your spouse, you want your, the, your loved ones to make sure they are living for the Lord. So Lot has these two daughters, and they're engaged to get married. And apparently, his future son-in-laws, they aren't Bible-believing Christians. They, don't, they, aren't, they, they have seemed to just fall into the thinking of the men of Sodom. Look here in verse 14. Last verse we're going to read in this section. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were going to marry his daughters. Get up. They're just sitting around. He said, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. And Lot, this is, you know, probably... If you had a son-in-law and God had told you this, you would expect them, you know, would they at least respect their father, future father-in-law a little bit? Not at all. There was no respect for Lot. He had lost all respect in that city. And I want to tell you, that's how you know you've lost influence. The men of the city didn't care anything about Lot, what Lot had to say. They had lost respect to him. He even told them. He says, listen, y'all are doing something evil. And then they look at him, how dare you, you, you judge me? Who are you to come and speak to me this way? So he goes to his future son-in-laws and says, look, the Lord is going to destroy this place. We need to leave. And look at their response. But his sons-in-laws thought he was joking. What a joke, Lot. What a joke. The God's not going to destroy this place. This is Sodom. This is the best city on the, around. Look how good things are here. We've got everything we need. Lots of money, freedom, anything. I'm not leaving this place. Dad, future father-in-law, just go to bed. Just, just get back to it. You just need to chill out a little bit. We're not going anywhere. Yeah, I want to read something here in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. This is why homosexuality is wrong. It's actually revealed to us in Genesis chapter 1. This actually sets a course for all of humanity. And God's actually going to teach us about biology right here. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. We are created in the image of God. That's what sets us apart from all creation. He created him in the image of God. He created them, look at this, male and female. This is so simple. There's two sexes, male and female, man and woman. God has created that. Why would God create two sexes? Do you know more and more, it's so sad. I was even talking to Sherry about yesterday. I'm filling out these forms online. It says gender. Male, female, and then the third choice yesterday. This is yesterday. It said X. What is X? And last week, one said non-binary. What is that? That's not what the Word of God says. It's saying here, he creates male and female. And then we wonder, why would God create a man and a woman? What is the purpose of two genders? Well, it's actually revealed right here in verse 28. It says, Genesis 1, 28, God blessed Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. There it is. The purpose of humanity for a male and a female, is for them to repopulate the earth. Homosexuality does not allow that. It doesn't. It goes against biology. A man and a woman, the Lord is saying, y'all go out and have lots of babies. Have lots, have, fill your pew. Have big families. Have all sorts of youngins everywhere. These are good. God says children are good. They are a blessing to the Lord. That's God's plan. Well, the men of Sodom and the sin of Sodom right here, folks, that flies directly in conflict of Genesis 1, 27 and 28. You can't multiply and fill the earth. The men of Sodom were not repopulating. They weren't. This one out of four people, this generation Z coming up, they're not going to have, if they're part of this LGBT. Q plus, they're not going to be having lots of babies. They can't. It goes against biology. Folks, this is so simple. This is Genesis 1 stuff. This is stuff you should learn when you're 4 or 5. I mean, it's basic reproduction. Yet, the, by Genesis chapter 19, sin had morally corrupted reproduction in the sexes. Gender, men and women. That's what sin does. Say, how do you know that, Pastor? Turn your Bibles here to the book of Romans. I want to show you this scripture. Paul wrote about this. He talks about what happens to people when they become uh, morally confused. It says here in our Bibles, Romans chapter 1, verse 24. This is probably one of our clearest scriptures about what happens when people have become morally depraved. And we are, we, this is all around us. Before I want to read this, I want to share with you, how do people today rationalize? Because I want to tell you, if you go out and you teach this scripture to people and you show people, hey, you need to read Genesis chapter 19. See what happens in Sodom. See where we get the word sodomy from. It comes from Genesis chapter 19 and, the, and the, what the men of the city were doing. If you go out and you teach that to someone, this is the response people actually say today. If you go out and say, you know, that homosexuality is a sin and because Sodom was judged by the Lord, people will look at you and say, oh, those men of the city, they wanted to gang rape the two angels. Well, that's not, that's not, was the, that was not the problem there. It wasn't that they were looking to gang rape because they, did, they had no interest in what virgin daughters these men were morally depraved they wanted to have sexual relations with those two angels who were men who were identified as men second people will say well we're more sophisticated than the time of sodom pastor that was that was thousands of years ago you know what nothing has changed in this world nothing ever since the sixth day of creation god created man and woman his work is done and then we had the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Nothing has changed except Jesus died and rose again. We get saved. Other than that, it's the same old sin, same old problems. Nothing's new. People still need Jesus. The Bible actually teaches us that folks will be thinking of new sins. There'll be a new sin down the road. 
Marcy, Sherry's sister's in town, was telling me that she read somewhere, I've heard about trans handicapped people. Trans handicapped. Is that right, Marcy? Tra- what on earth is that? I mean, what is a trans handicapped? I heard that. Is that somebody who just parks in the handicapped place at Walmart and says, well, I'm trans handicapped. I mean, you see, there, there is no end to this stuff, to sin. No end. And the, that, that's so... We, have, we are not a more sophisticated time than the time of Sodom. God's plan still is in place from creation. God's plan for salvation is still in place. It started out with the call of Abraham, and then it finishes here with Jesus' death and his resurrection. That was his plan. And then the third reason people reject the sin of Sodom is they say Jesus promotes love. He wants us to love whom we want. Just love whoever. Well, the problem with that is that you, when you go down that road, you can break every single scripture possible in the name of love. You can do anything you want and say, well, God is love and he wants me to love others. Love is ultimately it comes from God. And it's us lining up our lives with what God has saying. We show that we love the Lord by obeying what he says. Your children, your grandchildren show that if you ask them to do something, they show, express their love to you if they obey you. They say, I love my grandfather, I love my mother, because that is my mother, and I want to honor the Lord, I will do what she's asking me to do. So when we just go around throwing out the love word, over, we, you can, that can be cover for any and every type of sin. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Therefore God delivered them over to their desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. I want to tell you, God, somebody who's, who's Im- impure, at some point He'll just deliver them over. Say, just do whatever you want. If that's who you are going to be, you go for it. So that their bodies were degraded among themselves. Look at this. Look at the exchange that's made here. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served what has been created instead of the Creator, who is praised forever. Amen. So now we're going to get more details in these next couple of verses. For this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, meaning God created women to have sexual relations with the men, and then all of a sudden, the exchange was they exchanged men for women. This is what we call being a lesbian. It's unnatural, the Bible says. Then in verse 27, it says, The men, in the same way, also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men who received in their own persons as the appropriate penalty for their error. Now, do you see anything positive about Paul's description in Romans chapter 1 about homosexuality. How can someone say the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality? That is a condemnation right there. Look at the words that are described. Shameless, error, unnatural, inflamed with lust, penalty. All of these are negative words used around these sins. What God has created for a man to have sexual relations with a woman, it's shameless, the Bible says, to exchange that for a man. It goes against creation. It's actually an attack on God. That's what homosexuality is. You're saying, God, you created me to have natural relations with a woman, but I'm going to exchange this and go down the road of moral depravity and do it with another man. That is why this is wrong. So we, here we are this morning. Say, Daniel, there's, there's gay, gay people all, all around us. How do, how do we witness to a gay person? What if you know? What if you work with someone? And we all do. What if you have family members? Again, we all do. How do we as Christians be a witness to our homosexual friends? So here it is. I'm putting it up on the, sc- on the screen. This is what we do. If we have, we know of someone who is struggling with this sin or who is practicing this sin. Number one you need to encourage them to repent. We're calling people. God calls people to repent. And you do this in a nice, kind, loving way. And you show them the scriptures. 
You let them know that Jesus Christ, he forgives, and not only that, he saves, including the sin of homosexuality. God can save gay folks. He absolutely can do it. Jesus died and rose again for the LGBTQ plus community. And our job is in a loving way to call folks who are struggling with that to repentance. No reason to be ashamed for it. Number two, kindly show them the scriptures. The word of God is alive. In a kind way, you show them Genesis chapter 19. Let them know this is what God, how God judged. Find this sermon somewhere. I just preach right here actively and let them listen to it. Say, listen to what this preacher here said about this. And read those scriptures I just read. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 19, Romans chapter 1. These scriptures I just read speak so clearly to homosexuality. It lays a foundation for it. And we encourage them to read these Bible verses. The Word of God will speak to them. I once heard, you know, I listened to Focus on the Family podcast. And I was listening to a lady who was a college professor, and she was in a lesbian lifestyle, lesbian relationship. And do you know what delivered her from it? A friend got her a Bible. She started reading her Bible. And the Word of God, she says, she says it's like it came alive. The Word of God will speak to people. It shows people the truth. You mean trust in this book right here. All 66 books, it is alive, and it will point people to truth. So it's not, it's not on us. It's the Lord. And knowing that, you begin praying that their eyes are opened. And why do you need to pray their eyes are opened? Remember what happened to those men? The angel struck them with blindness. People who are trapped in the LGBTQ plus community are enduring a spiritual blindness. And we want the Lord to open their eyes. They open their eyes. Invite them to church. Let them know that Jesus Christ can transform their sexuality. And you do this in a kind, loving way. You take their hand and say, son, daughter, granddaughter, cousin, you need to read these scriptures. You need to see what the girl... Don't get your theology from TikTok. Don't get it from the internet. The Word of God will speak to people who's, who are, who's in this community and this lifestyle. So I think the response to us, we are living in a time of Sodom. Lexington is Sodom. It's not just Lexington. It's everywhere. And our responsibility is we want to make sure we are grounded We know what we believe, and more importantly, we know why we believe it. These scriptures I just shared with you are helping us stay rooted on what we believe. We should not shy away from this. We should not be embarrassed. We boldly stand on the Word of God. Jesus Christ died for every single person on earth. That is why we read that passage in Genesis 127. They were created in the image of God. Jesus loves gay people. He wants to see gay people saved. And their path towards salvation is repenting and believing in Jesus. And it's our responsibility as Bible-believing Christians to be praying for them and be actively sharing the gospel with those who are struggling with this sin. Lord, I thank you for these words. Lord, I pray this morning as we talk about issues that is so important for us today, Lord, help us have a rock-solid faith on why we believe what we believe. Lord, we shouldn't be embarrassed. We shouldn't be ashamed. Lord, we shouldn't be apologetic. Lord, we stand on the Word of God. It is so clear. Lord, we don't want to be hateful. We, with kindness and love, we proclaim the truth. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here in this sanctuary, or if we know any family members that are struggling with this, Lord, speak to them this morning. Give us the boldness this week to share with them the truth. Lord, you call us to repent. Lord, you are a loving God, and you extend grace and forgiveness to all of those who are created in your image, which includes our homosexual friends. Lord, this invitation is one that we boldly respond to you. I thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. Lord, we pray this is our time to join our church, Lord, to come and pray for those who need prayer. And it's our third time to walk this aisle and say, Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm ready to be saved. Jesus, we give you our invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close our...
our worship service here with our time of invitation. We're going to sing I Surrender All. Wonderful Bible, wonderful scripture here. It's hymn number 433, I Surrender All. So we're going to stand together. I'm going to be standing down front along with our deacons. You respond to the gospel this morning. All to Jesus I surrender. I will, I will be standing in our welcome center here. We have our welcome center for guests. If you're thinking about making a decision, you come take my hand and we, I can talk you through that. I want to let you know about a couple of events and announcements coming up this week. We have Sunday school that's going to be starting in a few minutes. Uh, and you do want to go to a Sunday school class. Again, you go to our welcome center and you find your, uh, your class there where to go. I will actually be teaching one of our Sunday school classes today. It's going to be our, our uh, Discover Broadway class. If you're new to our church, you can come attend it. If you don't know where to go, just go to our Welcome Center, and I will be there to take you to that class. We're going to be talking about what it means to be a church member. So it's a good class. Um, our regular teachers are out sick today, so I'm going to, I'll be taking over that. So uh, I want to encourage you to um, uh, certainly attend Sunday school. Also tonight, Beecher McCarthy is our revival worship led by our praise band. So Beecher and his band, they're going to be leading our worship service tonight at 6 o'clock. Two weeks from tonight, or from today, in this service, we're going to have our baby dedication. That is Mother's Day. Can you all believe Mother's Day is almost here? It's in two weeks. It's coming up. We already have some babies ready to be dedicated. If you have a child, a baby, and we need to dedicate babies to the Lord. Jesus was dedicated, Lord. Maybe you have some grandbabies. And maybe they don't go to church anywhere. You know, we will dedicate any child to the Lord. The Lord loves all babies and small children. So you need to reach out to me this week. Say, Pastor, I've got a grandchild, a daughter, whoever. And I'll be getting in touch with them. It's always a special service to dedicate your children to the Lord. And we're going to do that on no better day than on Mother's Day. So that's in two weeks. But I need to be hearing from you for that. So those are some of the things going on this week. Good. We'll sing the chorus, Oh, How I Love Jesus. (laughs) 